Thank you very much. Um, I would like to start by sharing with you an anecdote. And I believe this anecdote tells a big story. At the end of the anecdote, I could almost stop and walk off stage. Now, last year, I was very happy and very grateful to be invited to the United States to speak at a number of universities. And some of those were Ivy League universities. Now, I'm a relatively newcomer to talking in these sorts of settings. So in an Ivy League setting, you, you want to look the part, don't you? Your presentation, you want to be glib, sophisticated, speak with ease. Because your presence often carries with it your credibility. So it was to some alarm that the day before I was supposed to be at Washington University, I woke up to find that half my face had migrated south down into my boots. I had total facial paralysis on the left side. That was a little off-putting, I can tell you. Now, I felt otherwise all right, so I didn't think much was amiss. And I'm a psychiatrist. I don't remember a lot of general medicine. <laughs> but back down in the primary parts of my memory, I remember if you have total unilateral paralysis, it's a hell of a lot than having half of it. My wife had some trouble being convinced of that. But then I did remember there's a thing called Bell's palsy. And I felt pretty confident I had Bell's palsy. Now, of course, with half my face dripping down towards my shoe, I looked anything but the convincing part. It was off-putting speaking. I started to sound a bit like Al Pacino and Scarface. <laughs> but unfortunately, I didn't have the rugged good looks to make up for the silly speech. Now, we have all heard many things about the idiosyncrasies of the American healthcare system, and I wanted to avoid it at all costs. So I thought, look, generally, this is a self-limiting disease. I'm rugged and strong, as I'm sure you can all tell. <laughs> so it should all settle quite nicely. The following day, I went down to the local cafe in a very upmarket side of town, and I thought I was doing all right. And then I looked down, and my shirt was covered with coffee. It had all dribbled down the side of my face. And I thought, OK, we need to get into the healthcare system here, because I know if I get prednisone and acyclovir, it can make a difference to the disease course. Well, do you think I could get into primary care? It was impossible. I got by my first presentation, made a few jokes about Al Pacino, and got by all right. But for my second presentation at Dartmouth University, I asked whether I could get into the primary care system of the university. And I was told that I couldn't, so I was sent down to the local teaching hospital, where I presented myself. I gave my account. The medical team treated me very well. I was ushered into an examination room. And the first person that came in was a billing clerk. Now, the billing clerk is this beast of the American healthcare system, quite a creature. So she had a clipboard and a whole lot of uh, questionnaires. First and foremost, she wanted to see my credit card before anything else. Then she wanted to make sure that I had health insurance. Beyond that, she wanted to have usual demographics, medical history, and so on. She got me to sign a whole lot of disclosure documents that even as a forensic psychiatrist, I had trouble following. Nevertheless, I signed those, and then she looked at me and she asked me if, in the case of an emergency, did I want to be resuscitated? <laughs> and I thought, and I've got a young son, a young family, I thought, yes, yes, thank you very much, that would be nice. <laughs> so she wrote away. Then she said, without a hint of irony, this is not a joke, she said, do you have any advanced healthcare directives? And I thought, bugger me. So if I was brain dead, did I want to be kept going for a while? And again, I suggested that I would, thinking of my family. Eventually, she asked me to take my top off, get into the, the, the patient gown, and wait for the doctor. Within an hour, the doctor arrived, a very pleasant fellow. He took one look at me. I took one look at him. We both agreed I had Bell's palsy. I did not want any other investigations. He gave me a script for prednisone and acyclovir. I said, thank you very much put my shirt on, and as I was about to leave, the billing clerk came back in. And she said, would you like to pay for your bill now? And I thought, what a great system. How efficient is that? And I thought, OK, well, let's have a look. And they presented me with a bill for 857 US dollars. Now, it was at that point that I realized why she had asked me whether I wanted to be resuscitated. <laughs> Thank you.
Now, even the most robust individual, surely a Kiwi would have a heart attack if not a stroke when being presented with such a ridiculous thing. I could stop there because that tells you what privatised, what for-profit healthcare looks like. And the TPPA is in many ways influenced, it is the mastermind of the US healthcare system. Now, I have told this story in many settings. I've actually got my $857 worth because it's helped me to give a lot of presentations. In New Zealand, most people just shake their head. They can't believe it. 857 bucks for a five-minute consultation. Obviously, they think it's exorbitant. When I have told it in the States, they can't believe it, that I got away with it so cheaply, in fact. I kid you not. Almost any Congress, any medical practitioner that I speak to in the States says to me, well, you got off lightly. What are you worried about? This is what's at stake here. This is what we're up against. Now, the US, compared to many other countries, always underperforms in healthcare provision. A recent study that compared the US to New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the UK found that it scored bottom or second to bottom on five commonly used measures of reasonable healthcare access, equity, safety, healthy lives. And it does so despite spending up to 20% of its GDP on healthcare. We do much better than them, spending only around 12% of our GDP, if I'm not wrong. Now think about this. The US wants to tell us how to run a healthcare system. The team at the bottom of the, lab of the table is telling the team towards the top how to do business. Think about this. Tim Grosser calls Steve Hansen the coach of the All Blacks. Hi, Steve. Tim Grosser here, yeah, trade minister. Well, you've been doing very well. The team's doing fantastically well, but I want to tell you that I'm changing the coaching structure. Steve goes, well, why is that? We're doing so well. I can't tell you that. But I'm going to replace you with a coaching team of Finland. <laughs> now, what would Steve Hansen say? Finland is the bottom of the league in terms of rugby. I saw that yesterday. Now, Steve Hansen, Richie McCoy and the boys, I'm sure you and the New Zealand public would say, surely not. Why would you do that? Well, my friends, that is what's being proposed through the TPPA. We want the team at the bottom of the league to coach the team towards the top of the league. And I hope that that strikes you as ridiculous as it strikes me. So what is the TPPA? And you can say at TPPA, it sounds Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. It sounds great, doesn't it? It sounds reassuring. A group of people sitting around the Pacific agreeing, negotiating some sort of trade deal that is going to benefit all of us. That's what the branding sounds like. But the branding is misleading, and that's what I want to talk about today. The negotiations involve 12 different countries some very poor countries, such as Vietnam and Peru, and some much richer countries. It's an ambitious trade deal. It absorbs 40% of the world's GDP, so there's a lot at stake here. It has 29 chapters, and it covers a whole range of issues. I want to only talk about health and access to health in this presentation. Now, what the TPPA is looking at is obligations in relation to the protection of intellectual property rights, protection of foreign investment, coherence of internal regulations, that is each country's regulations, policies and processes, and it talks about government transparency, in addition to other trade issues such as the removal of tariffs. But in general, the reduction of tariffs has been dealt with in trade agreements. The first four on that slide talk about behind the border regulation. And those are the policies and the regulations each country puts into place to protect the health and the environment of its citizens. Now what industry argues is that there is disharmony in these policies, that too much policy interferes with trade. So what they're advocating is a reduction in policy. It's a veritable race to the bottom. And those mandatory regulatory price, uh, practices will favor corporate interests well ahead of national sovereignty for sensible health policy development. That is one of my concerns. A couple of economic concepts which I would like to share with you. 
Economists argue that there's two simple ways by which you become rich. You either create wealth or you take wealth away from others. When you create wealth, you contribute to society. When you take wealth away, as monopolies do, you take away from society because you stifle competition. Now, when economists talk about rent, traditionally, they talk about the returns to land. So if you own a house, you rent it, you get a return. So you get income not from what you do, but from what you own. The concept of rent has been increased to monopoly rents. So the control of, mo of a monopoly can allow you to charge rents from the population, if you like. So monopoly control can be the access to great wealth. But in accessing that wealth, you don't create that wealth. You take it away from others. And rent seeking is the process by which great wealth can be amassed by changes in rules that allow the wealthy to collect rents from monopoly power from the rest of society. What the TPPA will do is it will allow it's been influenced by rent seeking. So how bad is this? Let me give you an example. Back to the American healthcare system. In 2003, the Bush administration changed the Medicare Prescription Drug Act. In doing so, it was certainly influenced by lobbying from the health industry. Did you know there are 3,100 health lobbyists in Washington? Six per every congressman. Well, the new rules around the Medicare Act stated that the government could no longer bargain in the purchase of medications, like Pharmac does on our behalf. So competition was stopped. What was the outcome of that? Recent conservative estimates state that 50 billion extra dollars a year were spent in the Medicare pharmacy budget. In the past 10 years to 2013, that amounted to half a trillion dollars of wealth that shifted from the public purse to the corporation. This cost of medication has been considered to be one of the main drivers of the deficit in the US economy. Rent seeking obviously contributes to inequality. And the TPPA is significantly influenced toward rent seeking. So I put to you, what does that say to us about partnership and agreements within the TTPA? How does that stack up with the government's priority to eradicate childhood poverty, manage chronic illnesses, deal with inequality? It is contrary to those stated aims. The New Zealand government, and New Zealand is a great country. I know we talk a lot about burnout and people being disenchanted with their jobs. I travel extensively. I come from Latin America. I tell you, we've got a good healthcare system. We have to protect this. There are problems, but where is there not? In 1993, the government could see the writing on the wall because of the rapidly escalating medication prices, so they set up Pharmac, our pharmaceutical procurement agency, and it had particular legal obligations to deliver the best health outcome that is reasonable achievable from pharmaceutical treatment and from within a capped amount of funding. In 2013, that funding is $786 million. Now, Pharmac has a whole range of procurement strategies, which I don't have sufficient time to talk about, but they're very successful. And we do very well. Pharmac serves us, the taxpayer, and the medical profession very well. We pay about a half to a third of what Australians and the US pay for the same medications. In its 2012 annual report, Pharmac stated that a collective $5 billion had been saved from 2000 to 2012 because of the pharma strategy. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money that goes to providing for unmet need for public health priorities. We are at stake of losing this. What makes pharma so successful also makes it a target for the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm not being overly dramatic, and us Latin Americans are prone to drama. 
I'm not being overly dramatic when I compare this as a David and Goliath type struggle. US industry and the US government has cited Pharmac as an impediment to industry and it is seeking to undermine its power. And this is what's being argued within the TPPA. Now, in response to the minister yesterday, he assured us that he won't get rid of Pharmac. And I trust him. But I also believe that politicians are very good at gobbledygook and doublespeak. I don't believe they'll get rid of Pharmac. They won't have to. The changes that will be imposed as part of the TPPA will emasculate Pharmac. So it won't allow it. It won't give it the tools that it has used up to now to give us the cheap medications. That's what's at stake, and that's what we have to ask government. Not whether they will disestablish Pharmac, but whether they will allow Pharmac to function as a successful pharmaceutical procurement body. Any pharmacologists or psychopharmacologists in the audience? Anyone awake? <laughs> Does anyone know what that is? Very good. So that's olanzapine. Can anyone tell the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right? One is cheaper. <laughs> Cheeky sort, aren't you? <laughs> and that's, there is no difference in the chemical structure. The one on the left costs 32 million more dollars than the one on the right. Between 10 to 2010 and 2012, the price of antipsychotic medications to Pharmac went down by 32 million, largely driven by the entry of the generic olanzapine into the market, which dropped the price of the originator down to 4%. That's what is at stake here, $32 million. That was 4% of the Pharmac budget on one medication. In 2010, antipsychotics were the most expensive medication group, and they dropped down to seventh place by 2012. So that's what we are potentially bargaining away here. $32 million buys you a lot of health care. Now, I've written a couple of papers, and I'm very pleased that they have been given to you. So that's where the detail in relation to the TPP negotiation lies. I want to talk through this fairly quickly. But my moving through the detail quickly does not mean that it's not important. My analysis, or indeed a number of people's analysis, academicians in relation to the TPPA, is based on leaked documents because the negotiations are held in secret or in confidence. In secret, that is, from people like us, from the population and from health experts. But there are 600 corporate representatives who have access to the negotiating documents, and it can actually influence the negotiating documents. So the confidentiality that's spoken about is a one-way confidentiality. Nevertheless, relying on those leaked documents, I can tell you that there are three not exclusive, but principal avenues by which the TPPA will provide pharmaceutical industry with extra privileges. And I want you to consider those extra privileges, privileges in the context of pharmaceutical behavior or strategy put into place by pharmaceutical industry to gain a market share or contain its monopoly. It will do it by changes in the intellectual property chapter by introductions of the transparency in regulatory chapter, which will look at procedural changes to Pharmac, and thirdly, by the introduction of investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. So insofar as the intellectual property chapter is concerned, there's a whole suite of changes that are likely to delay the entry of generic medications into the market. Patent term extensions beyond 20 years are sought, some people estimate that this could be anywhere between five and 20 more years. Data exclusivity, where the scientific data utilized to license the originator drug will be made unavailable to generic companies. Without that data, they won't be able to license their products. And that will put the generic company in an uncomfortable situation. They either have to wait out the data exclusivity period or they'd have to repeat studies which have already shown a positive finding. Now, can you imagine an ethics committee approving the repetition of studies which have already shown a positive effect? It's not going to happen. What is being sought is the patenting of medical methods, lab investigations, and even surgical procedures. 
people are looking at lowering the bar to patentability. So that is making minor changes to the chemical structure of those medications to extend patentability. So slow release formulas, extra release formulas, mirror images of the chemical structure will provide an extra period of patentability, keeping the price of medications up. Within the transparency chapter, industry seeking the removal of therapeutic reference pricing, and that will allow more Me Too type drugs. As a psychiatrist, there is any number of SSRIs that are staggered as they come into the market, and therefore they have different periods when the patents run out. They're almost all the same as far as efficacy and safety is concerned. But each time you introduce a new one, it's subject to new patents, and it costs a lot of money without delivering any extra benefit. So there is no cost effectiveness benefit from this. It is seeking to introduce appeals processes where industry can sit in in pharmac decision making. Moreover, industry could appeal the decisions of pharmac in court if they are contrary to their interests. You can imagine. Industry is also seeking to institutionalize direct to consumer advertising. Now, New Zealand and the US are the only two countries who are silly enough in the Western world to allow direct to consumer advertising. Through the TPPA, we won't be able to revert that. We are able to do so now. Why is that a worry? Well, industry argues that they have to be rewarded for all of the money they put into research and development. But what we now know is that industry spends as much or twice as much on advertising to sell the medications than they do in research and development. The third avenue, and perhaps the most concerning one, is the introduction of investor state dispute settlement mechanisms. Now what this does, it allows a corporation to sue a government. So corporations can and do sue governments. And they can sue governments if government policy or government regulation interferes with the value of their product. So if a government regulation leads to a loss of an expected income, the government can be sued. And in order for the government to be sued, you don't even first have to prove damages in local courts. It's an arbitration process which occurs offshore. It occurs behind closed doors, so it's not open to the public. And the lawyers are appointed and paid at the behest of the parties and they do not have to declare conflict of interest and do not have to adhere to domestic public health or environmental protection rules. It is clear that ISDS processes will inhibit the development of healthy policy. It will have a chilling effect. Put simply, it allows the rise of the corporation as an equal to the national state. Now that sounds a bit Orwellian. You'll be wondering whether the psychiatrist giving you the presentation has become deluded himself, because surely it is far-fetched. But we know that ISDS processes are already taking place. The Australian government has been sued by Philip Morris Asia because of bilateral agreement between Australia and Hong Kong, and this is in relation to plain packaging laws on tobacco products. Eli Lilly and Company is suing the Canadian government for $500 million for the removal of a patent on two medications, which is what which it was entitled to do according to its domestic laws, and it has been upheld by domestic laws. Now the government has assured us that they won't allow this to happen. So if ISDS clauses are introduced to the TPPA, it won't lead to trivial lawsuits. Well, history tells us otherwise. Look at the range of ISD challenges that have occurred up to now. There are over 600 of them. The government of El Salvador, one of the poorest countries in the world, is being sued for $2 billion by the gold mining industry because the government refused to concede a right for them to exploit for gold because of pollution to the rivers. These are the kind of mechanisms that are leading to these arbitration courts. So if we are going to do this, if we're going to let Finland coach the All Blacks, what about the opposition? What have we learned about pharmaceutical industry and knowing what pharmaceutical industry is like and its strategy 
to seek out its monopolies, well, how will it behave to this change of laws? Well, let's quickly look at pharmaceutical industry behavior or strategy, if you like. It is now beyond doubt that industry has used both legal and illegal methods to prolong monopolies and to extend market share. This is an area of research, and I have a number of publications in the area. Six principal ways by which they do this is the promotion of off-label prescribing, the interference with the scientific process with reporting bias of unpublished negative findings, misreported studies, medical ghost writing, increased expenditure and promotion, as I spoke about before, a whole range of evergreening strategies, and a range of legal actions to delay licensing authorities from allowing the entry of generics into the market. Off-label prescribing has grown enormously in the last 20 years. And a recent very good study coming out of the US looking at office-based physicians examining 160 commonly prescribed medications off-label found that 73% of those prescriptions had no evidence for safety or efficacy. And only about a quarter of them had strong scientific evidence. In a study we did in Christchurch, we determined that off-label use of the antipsychotic quetiapine cost us about $10 million a year without any evidence whatsoever for benefit and with full knowledge of side effects. But perhaps the best example of marketing running well ahead of reason is the extraordinary and dramatic expansion of atypical antipsychotic use off-label worldwide. In 2010, industry obtained $25 billion in profit from selling antipsychotic medications. Four of those were the, three of those were the 15th and 13th largest selling pharmaceuticals the world over. The rapid expansion of antipsychotic use is not in people suffering from psychotic disorders. Psychotic and psychotic spectrum disorders only affect about 2% of the population. The largest growth in prescription is in the very young. We are poisoning our children and in the very old. And this is driven by pharmaceutical industry strategy. It makes sense to them because it maximizes the profit and returns to the shareholder, which is the ethical principle from which they operate. And that obviously is going to be in contrast with the medical principles that we operate by. Misleading reporting. There is loads of literature in relation to this. As a psychiatrist, I feel compared to share with you some of this. In the early 1990s, there was a big debate as to whether children who are depressed should be treated with antidepressant medications. And there were three studies that largely shifted the opinion of child psychiatrists towards the prescription of medications. And they are study 329, study 377, and another study. Study 329 looked at 91 adolescents, and it compared the response to treatment between placebo and an SSRI. It came out of uh, Brown's University, I think, in the United States, and it was driven by Martin Keller. At the start of the study, there were two endpoints identified. Now, this is an important study because there's a lot riding on this. The initial review of the data, and we know this now from pharmaceutical memos, showed that there was no difference between placebo and paroxetine. Moreover, there were significantly more side effects associated to paroxetine. At that point, GSK contracted an advertising company known as Scientific Therapeutic Information. And they were obviously troubled by the data because it didn't further their course. So what STI did is they post hoc, after studying the study, they inserted eight new efficacy measures and proved that Paxil or Arapax was superior in four of those measures. The initial study that showed that there was no benefit from this medication and there was a likelihood of harm was transformed through ghostwriting and it was eventually published indicating that it was generally well tolerated and effective for major depression in adolescence. This is not rare, unfortunately. Now, the FDA has recently re-reviewed the raw data and now found that 10 out of the 93 participants in the studies had suicidal concerns after taking Paxil. 
So this is what scientific misreporting looks like. Evergreening strategies, minor changes to the chemical structure of a medication can allow the extension of patents. In a situation perhaps not too dissimilar to ours, in a study in the canton of Geneva in Switzerland, they looked at evergreening strategies of eight commonly used medications, antihistamines, proton pump inhibitors, hypnotics. And what they determined is that those evergreening strategies by industry cost the canton of Geneva an extra 30 million euros in drug costs between 2000 and 2008 without any clinically proven advantage in those medications. So it's costly and essentially useless. This behavior by industry is repetitive and it's part of strategy. Almost all the major corporations have been subject to lawsuits. There are dozens of them reported in the literature and I just include some of them. Pfizer was fined $2.3 billion for off-label marketing of pregabalin, valdexcobib, linusoid, and suppressidone in 2010. Eli Lilly was fined $1.4 billion for promoting off-label use of olanzapine, particularly amongst the elderly. Johnson & Johnson was fined $1.2 billion for misleading promotion of risperidone, particularly towards children. They overemphasized the benefits of the medication and they underrepresented the results. Now that fine has recently been reversed by the Arkansas Supreme Court, who stated that a corporation is allowed to behave in a, as an individual and as an individual to have a freedom of speech, which allowed them to get around the clauses around the illegality of promoting off-label prescribing. The record fine to 2012, there may be bigger ones by now, belongs to GSK, Glasgow Smith and Klein. Now they agreed to plead guilty and pay a record $3 billion fine for unlawful promotion of prescription drugs, including Avantia, antipsychotic medications, for failure to report safety data, for false price reporting. GSK signed a 123 page corporate integrity agreement with the US Department of Justice and agreed to have its activities regulated by the Department of Justice for the next five years. Now this was a bit of a public affairs disaster for GSK. So they appointed a young, suave, new CEO by the name of Andrew Whitty. And Andrew Whitty acknowledged to the public that industry had behaved in unsavory and illegal behavior. But hand on heart, he was even heard to say, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. Within months of those public statements, GSK was once again embroiled in allegations of corruption and criminal behavior in China and has subsequently been convicted for that. So these strategies are pervasive. They pay, even though the fines amount to billions of dollars, the profits far outweigh the fines. So much has it happened that it's now part of an academ academic studies have looked at pharmaceutical industry behavior. And a number of highly trustable, in my mind, scientifics have written books about the systematic corruption of pharma and how they are undermining the scientific process. Some of them even argue that the scientific process is dead because of the influence of industry. Some of these writers include Peter Gersha, who's the head of the Cochrane Foundation in Norway, Marcia Agnell, who was the chief editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, her predecessor chief editor, Ben Goldacre, who you've probably all heard about, so this is systematic, this is strategy, this is what these guys do. Elric Holder, the US Attorney General, in commenting about the legal action and the behavior of industry makes the following statement. The behavior of industry can put the public health at risk. It can corrupt medical decisions by healthcare providers and take billions of dollars directly out of taxpayers' pockets. This is what the US Attorney General is saying in relation to the behavior of industry. Now, I have talked to you briefly about the TPPA and what is being bargained in secret and the behavior of industry. 
Now I want to go back to my day-to-day -day job. I am a forensic psychiatrist. And part of the job of the forensic psychiatrist is to do risk assessment. So what is the risk of a particular behavior recurring in the future? This is important because if we have violent offenders and we're considering discharging them from hospitals, we want to make sure that they're rehabilitated, that their illnesses are treated, and that there is no longer a public safety risk. Now, good risk assessments require a combination of the use of actuarial tools and clinical judgment. And I have taken the liberty of doing a risk assessment of what will happen if we prosecute the TPPA as it is proposed. What is the best predictor of future behavior? Now, you don't have to be a psychiatrist to get this one right. <laughs> past behavior. The best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. Now, I have highlighted some of the past behavior of industry. I think my arguments are convincing. I'm happy to have a discussion if people disagree. The next thing is the frequency of the offending behavior and the versatility of it. These guys are sophisticated and they do it systematically. But hey, we also know in psychiatry that historical factors can't be changed. You can't change history and people do move on. And in forensic psychiatry, we treat them for that. We do treatment interventions such as psychological interventions to encourage those who engage in risk-taking behaviours to see what they do, to have empathy and to develop other techniques for dealing with conflict. Those are dynamic factors and they're amenable to change through intervention. The first thing we look at is what is the attitude of the offender? Do they tend to justify the behaviour? All I can see and read about industry is they do. They see it as part of business. They look at maximization of profits as their bottom line. Any problem associated with that is considered an externality which is later dealt with. So their attitude is concern, concerning. Then we look at around what is the offender's sincerity or insincerity in relation to their offending behavior. Are they genuinely remorseful or contrite? And that can be a real problem because psychopathic people can seem to be remorseful they can be convincing that they've engaged in remediation attempts, but underlying it, they can be quite insincere. GSK, Andrew Whitty, hand on heart, I am sorry, two months later, the same sort of allegations coming out of China. Despite signing an agreement not to behave in the way they have in the past, I detect a degree of insincerity there. Generally, the more concerning people who put the public at considerable risk, we need to make sure that they comply with remediation attempts. Do they take their medications? Do they stop taking drugs and alcohol? What is the risk of them reoffending? Well, what industry has shown us is that they have consistently signed these good bond behaviour agreements and they've continuously breached them. So they are unable or unwilling to comply with remediation attempts. Put it all together, it doesn't require a lot of clinical judgment to tell you that we are stepping into very dangerous territory because I do believe that the industry will take full advantage of any change in local regulations to maximise their profits and prolong monopolies. Now, the one thing I like is principles of equivalence. I think that if you want people to trust you, you apply the same rules across the board. Now, I hope that you will share with me a desire to know what the content of the negotiating documents looks like because of its likely effect on us healthcare providers. So far, the government has said we can't do that because that's not how we do trade deals. Well, I simply don't accept that. But also, I would like to go back to John Key. Do you remember John Key and his debate with Phil Goff in the lead up to, I can't remember which election, someone will know. Now, you listen to this. Can we get that audio to work? Okay, tell me where the fourteen billion is coming from. Repeating it. Just tell me where the money's coming. Show me the money. Show me the money. I've got to tell you this. One more time. I really like it. Okay, tell me where the fourteen billion is coming from. Repeating it. Just tell me where the money's coming. Show me the money. Show me the money. I've got to tell you this. Okay, so look, let's apply a principle of equivalence. John Key simply would not accept that Phil Goff was saying that they could deliver a lot more for the citizens of the country because he couldn't show him the money. Now, what he is asking us, the medical professions and the citizens of this country to do is to trust him that he's bargaining and going to get a lot of benefits for us. 
I go back to the principle of equivalence. Show me the data. Show me the detail. Don't promise, show me the detail. It's the same as him saying, show me the money. And that's what we should be seeking the government to do, to tell us what is being negotiated and what we're likely to win and lose. There's a lot of promise out there. The government of Malaysia have just done an in-depth report, and in their view, they are not going to gain anything by signing up to the TPPA. As a matter of fact, it may well stifle industry. Now, I'm not a trade negotiator. I don't know the details, and I don't know how you analyse the pluses and the minuses here. Certainly from an ethical, moral perspective, if you're bargaining away the right to health policy and environmental protection, I do believe you're on tenuous ground. But imagine if you get nothing in return for it. And I do believe that that's the crossroads where we are at at the moment. Now, finally, given that I'm sort of commenting on government policy and government strategy, I want to say that you've all heard John Key saying that we need a new flag, haven't you? Yeah, New Zealand needs a new flag. We need to be a republic. We need to show that we are, we're a unique country. And a lot of people have sort of, I think, quite unfairly criticised the government for wanting a new flag. They said, look, it's distracting. There are much bigger issues. There's much bigger fish to fry. Why a new flag? Well, I want to say I sympathise with John Key, and I, and I think we should look at a new flag. We should have a referendum on this. But, of course, I want to propose a new flag, and I want to share that with you now. So let's go for a new flag, and this is what I want it to look like. <laughs> And finally, before I take any questions, don't just take my word for it. I want to put for you in the final slide the comments made by people in the know about the TPPA. There is two Nobel Prize economists making comments, and they speak very negatively about it. Medications Without Borders and Margaret Chan, the, the Director of Health from the WHO, have made the following comments in relation to the TPP. Thank you very much.